What happened to the Flag Smashers? When does the government make you Captain America? What do we call you? Is it still Falcon? Or is it Captain Falcon? Sam, thank you so much. From all of us. Sincerely. You did your part in dealing with those terrorists, now we'll do ours. You have to stop calling them terrorists. What else would we call them? These labels, terrorists, refugee, thug, they're often used to get around the question why. Look, I get it, but you have no idea how complicated this situation is. You know what, you're right. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. So, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Yet another Disney third squeezed directly into the mouths of tasteless consuming masses to justify all those Disney Plus subscriptions. A six hour serving of plot holes, narrative figure aids, characters suffering from permanent brain damage, laced with inconsistent messages and baffling morals. The whole show is utter Garbador. Except that Garbador is at least funny to look at. And it's not like it's entirely unviable in black and white. You know what, never mind, metaphor aborted. In any case, the show is horrid in any aspect you may think of, bar the production values which are obviously pristine due to Disney's blood money. And by that I mean purely the CGI budget. The choreography of fight scenes and other details like that are iffy at best. But hey, I don't really concern myself with anything further than the quality of the narrative, so as far as I'm concerned, the show is worthless. And yet, I am willing to have my views challenged. Let there be no question about it. Who knows, maybe I'm wrong, and the show is secretly genius or some such. So I went ahead and scoured YouTube for positive takes about the show. And let me tell you, there are quite a few of them. It's almost as if vast amounts of people are sheep who latch onto anything that's currently popular. I could offer my retorts to any of them, but after careful consideration, I settled upon a video by one brown table. His video is quite well received so I'm sure we'll be getting a robust display of the show's merits. I'll be offering my own thoughts whenever I find his analysis and argumentation to be lacking. Now Browntable himself is a relatively well-known figure in the... um... video essay sphere of YouTube, notable for many takes that are the brainiest of brainy, such as thinking that approaching a lady, offering help, and asking for them to smile is in fact... Sexual harassment. So you know we are dealing with an intellectual juggernaut. But that's enough of my intro. Let's start the video and allow Browntable to explain to us exactly how Falcon and the Winter Soldier is a fantastic show. A masterpiece even. And here we go. This video is sponsored by Storyblocks. Yes, gotta get that shilling started as soon as possible. In 2020, I specifically remember thinking, wow, I am kind of exhausted by the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Everything that isn't Avengers is terribly mediocre. Hold it. You just placed Far From Home into the same category as Captain Marvel. Terribly mediocre? Nah, you are wrong. I know it's your opinion, but your opinion is shit. Whether you compare these two movies in terms of script cohesion, characterization, humor, special effects, messages and morals, anything. It is an objective fact that Captain Marvel is an empty husk of a movie, and Far From Home laughs at its decrepit shell. Any sane person will tell you this. For the purposes of this argument, it's not even a discussion whether or not Far From Home should be considered a good film. You don't even have to like it. But there is a thing called scale. And if by your standards Far From Home is indeed mediocre, then Captain Marvel should rest firmly in the kill it with fire category. There's a Black Widow movie coming out, and it's it's Black Widow, so... so I sleep. Why exactly wouldn't you be looking forward to the Black Widow movie? You don't find her interesting? Sure, fair enough. But if that's the standard we are going with, then it is curious. I kept saying the MCU should have ended with Endgame. And, to be fair, that would have been a perfect finale. Now that's a perversion of the word perfect. Now, a year later, WandaVision comes out, and it's ridiculously good. No. No, it is not. 
but just out of curiosity, which part was your favorite? Was it the lost here mystery bait bullshit that lasted all of three episodes? Was it the asinine world building, the nonsensical magic, the flat characters, the tensionless action, or maybe it was Kat Dennings and her shrill voice? Problem is that it doesn't stick the landing, but I rather appreciated what the show was going for. As for sticking the landing, whatever the hell that means in this context, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that you are talking about the ending being an utter clusterfuck. But that's just it. It's not just the ending. The entire show is six hours of wasted human existence. The ending merely solidifies that. The main character of the show, Wanda Maximoff, captures and tortures a town full of people, causing them unimaginable psychological trauma, never tries to fix her mistakes or compensate her victims for all their suffering, and then gets to leave scot-free while getting a you go girl pat on the back by Captain Marvel adjacent over here. The morals of this show are completely out of whack. Oh, but Wanda was sad, so it's okay if she does horrible things, because she was sad. It must be so hard being the only person in the entire history of human existence, or the MCU, who has ever lost a loved one. Could you imagine if all of us acted like Wanda? And fuck what the show was going for. You are insane for apologizing for this kind of blatant ineptitude and horrible morals. The MCU is evolving, it's trying new things. What exactly is the MCU trying that's new? New ways to sell absolute nonsense to stupid masses? It's become so insanely popular that they can honestly do anything they want now. It is so popular it cannot fail financially, no matter how shit it becomes. Do you even listen to yourself when you speak these things? You would never cite something like this as anything positive for a product that you personally don't appreciate. And while WandaVision tries new things visually and film-wise compared to the rest of the MCU... That's the merit of WandaVision? The visuals? The story is shit, but the visuals are nice? Ridiculously good. Right. And what the fuck does film-wise even mean here? The way it is presented? So it has nice visuals? And also nice visuals? Yeah, thanks for that. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier makes it its mission to tackle new controversial themes and stories. And at a perfect time, too, with Marvel having massive success and with a world ready to tackle themes like these. Because there has never ever, not once, been a single story that included racism, terrorism or black people in them. I'm actually surprised I have to say this this early on in the video, but you, sir, are a fucking moron. Here's the main thing. I'm here to talk about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and the story of the show. And the story is very clearly political, and talks about racism, and how the United States treats its veterans and refugees, etc. And if you think that's cringe, well, you can just leave, I guess, because I'm not gonna deny the show its own message. These topics themselves aren't cringe, but the execution, and exploration of said themes is insultingly lazy and biased. I think the show tackles these issues incredibly well, and in general, comic books themselves have been politically charged with lots of social commentaries since their inception. You just said these kinds of stories are new not 20 seconds ago, and now you are saying these kinds of things have been done in the past? You are so caught up in trying to build up this show as something grand and meaningful and untouchable that you are already starting to contradict yourself. Speaking of comics, funnily enough, this speech from OG Steve Rogers is the central theme of this entire show. It doesn't matter what the what? press says. What the shit? What the, the, the fuck is happening here? Or the mob say. It doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something wrong is something right. Nani? This nation was founded on one principle, above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe, no matter the odds or the consequences. So when the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move. So instead of just showing the panel from the original comic, you decided to draw Captain America and Spider-Man, slide the camera slowly across the drawing, and make the character's mouth flap while they otherwise remain perfectly still. At this point, Mauricio is just flexing how good his animations look. What the fuck? 
Now before we get started, this video is sponsored by Storyblocks. I ain't gonna subject you to the shilling. After all, they ain't paying me. It's some bullshit about stock footage about girls in yoga pants or something. I think The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is one of the best things the MCU has put out. Out of all their productions, I feel like this is the most important, story-wise. Okay, that's a hefty heap of praise. Let's keep this in mind going forth. One of the best things in the MCU. So it has to be on par with the original Iron Man, Captain America, Guardians of the Galaxy and Civil War. And it is also the most important story that the series has told. Now, I expect some rigid points to back this up. Let's wait and see. I remember saying, wow, WandaVision is definitely one of the best things the MCU has made, and honestly, it's better than like half of what the MCU has produced. As well as you should remember saying that. After all, it's been no more than a couple of months. But then again, you can't even seem to remember your own statements between 20 second intervals, so I guess I should say congratulations. As for the latter part of that statement, that is hilariously wrong. Granted, most of the movies in the MCU aren't exactly known for their stellar writing, but WandaVision sits firmly at the bottom of the pile. It has all the same issues as things like 4-2, Iron Man 3 and Black Panther, those being continuity errors, inconsistent powers and world building, superfluous characters and a lack of consequence in the grand scheme of things. But on top of that, WandaVision also boasts a sadistic, monstrous protagonist whom the show paints as a hero by the end, which is directly promoting broken morals, so it is objectively worse than all of the previously mentioned stories. At the very least, when it comes to even the most lacking of stories in the MCU, the leads usually remain sympathetic and charming. Not so much for Wanda. But Falcon and the Winter Soldier makes WandaVision look ridiculously mid. And by the way, as I say this, I'm not counting Marvel Netflix, that's entirely different and Daredevil is better than the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe okay anyway. Sadly I cannot comment on Daredevil, since I've never been a subscriber of Pedoflix. Listening to others comment on it however, I've gotten the impression that it is a mixed bag. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is all about people who have differing agendas all going against each other. Every single character believes they're doing the right thing, and the story occurs when these agendas clash. Here's a tiny revelation for you. Everyone who has ever done anything, think that what they do is in the right. Otherwise they wouldn't do it. No one sees themselves as the villain. You may be familiar with these gentlemen. Obviously, this is referring to leading people in any conflict. Food soldiers can be intimidated and blackmailed to do the bidding of more powerful people, but as for the key figures, they all believe themselves to be justified. There is nothing special here. It can be as simple as Bucky thinking Sam shouldn't have given up the shield, and something more complicated like how Sam and Bucky don't think John Walker deserves the shield. Bucky is right. Sam shouldn't have given up the shield. It is childish self-doubting and angsting from a grown-ass man. Steve gave Sam the shield. He believed in him. That should be enough. And Sam initially accepted the shield in Endgame. This entire show is a huge retcon and shouldn't have happened. It is the definition of forced. As for Walker, he definitely deserves the shield and the title of Captain America. The show gives no reason why he shouldn't continue as Cap. In fact, he is the most morally solid character in the entire show. But I'm getting ahead of myself. And man, it is rich as shit. The show has some of the best character work in the entire MCU. So before we get to ideologies, let's just talk about something I just adore about the show, and that's the fact that these characters feel like people. Before we get to anything else, what is up with that white text on the screen? Who is it for? Is there someone actually watching this video going, Oh yes, I understood all the words he was saying but I didn't truly grasp their true impact before he showed them on the screen. You wanna know what I think? I think this is the same thing as the show is doing. Pointless posturing with no substance. As for the actual stupid thing that was said, some of the best character work in the entire MCU. We'll just add that to the list of praise and wait and see if there's anything to back it up characters feel like people. They aren't quip machines that simulate human emotions. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier succeeds in making most of its characters feel like people who live lives, have desires, and are just doing their best day to day. 
It is so refreshing to see what Sam's life is like outside of superheroing, what Bucky's life is as well. The show really develops these side protagonists that have not had enough screen time, and how they bring their own personal struggles into the action is what makes for great superhero storytelling. There's that white text again. You say it is refreshing to see these characters go through day-to-day -day lives. Yet, the fact of the matter is that this kind of characterization applies to every hero in the MCU. Pick whichever you want. The movies showcase the heroes doing mundane, down-to-earth things in between their superhero lives. You are praising this show being above all the rest, yet so far I'm not hearing it. And as a more damning note, the daily lives of Bucky and Sam and the story beats that facilitate them are terribly executed. In fact, their lacking ability to solve even the simplest of problems makes both of them seem more robotic than they previously were. Just going along the whims of the shitty plot, walking through life like NPCs in a video game. But I'm sure you will be shedding some light on this marvelous characterization soon enough. We have Sam, someone who's been resurrected thanks to Tony Stark and he's struggling to make ends meet even though he's a literal superhero. Which makes no sense, but go on. He's given up the shield as he believes not only does he not deserve it, but he isn't ready for the ramifications if he does accept it. Sam was ready to accept the shield in Endgame, and he did. This is a retcon. And what kind of ramifications are you talking about exactly? Worse, his sister wants to sell his family boat, something he doesn't want to happen. There's this scene in a bank that is just so great, because it's nice to see a superpowered being have to struggle with things regular people face. It humanizes the character and makes us empathize. The scene in the bank is just so great. Like how it makes no sense? The whole subplot about financing the goddamn fishing boat is asinine. There is a myriad of ways Sam could get the money to salvage his sister's sinking business. He is a superhero, working for the government, using fantastic tech, with ties to the Avengers and Stark Industries. There is no way he isn't paid big bucks for his work. He knows Pepper, and even though Sam and Tony had their differences, Tony was still his friend through Steve. Given all that we know about Pepper, she wouldn't hesitate for a second to help out Sam. She would absolutely lend him the money with no interest. If you wanna go a bit wilder, there's also the option of crowdfunding. Just imagine it. Hey everyone, it's your boy Falcon here. You know, the famous superhero. Listen, my sister's in a jam and she needs your help getting her business running. Any help would mean the world to me. Thanks y'all, fly safe. The money would not stop pouring in. And if it's a matter of some kind of childish pride, then I don't know what to tell you. Except that life is all about choices. And besides, it's a shitty old fishing boat. The world is burning, and you are seriously worried about something this tiny. On a side note, there's also the fact that Sam's sister is an insufferable, disrespectful cunt. Her attitude towards Sam is just baffling. She honestly has the guts to scold Sam like, while you are out there fighting terrorists and robots and aliens, the rest of us here are living in the real world. It's so hard, you have no idea. Bitch, you and your brats wouldn't even exist without people protecting the world and risking their lives on daily basis. Imagine someone talking like this to a firefighter or a police officer or a paramedic or a lawyer or a soldier. Given the top tier con status of Sam's sister, and the fact that the subplot with the boat drags on and on, eating away endless screen time that could have been spent fleshing out anything else. I can't see how anyone could find these scenes to be anything other than insulting waste of time. Bucky, on the other hand, is in therapy, so hey, good for him, and he's trying to right his wrongs and make amends due to his Winter Soldier past. Thing is, he's going about this the wrong way. The whole Nakajima subplot is absolute gold, dude. Wow, absolute gold? Well, please, do share this tale with us. As it turns out, he won't. He moves on swiftly to the next topic. Almost as if describing the actual contents of this oh-so-golden subplot would reveal some blemishes. No matter, dear viewer, you got me for the truth. So there's this older gentleman who has a dead son. We know this fact because he tells us, and the show isn't subtle about it at all. 
the man's entire personality starts and ends on the fact that he does indeed have a dead son. The term plot device comes to mind. Bucky killed his son while under the mind control of the Winter Soldier persona. He wishes to tell the guy, but chickens out in the end. Mind you, this happens right at the start of the series. After that, throughout the entire show, this subplot has no bearing on absolutely anything. And then, at the end of the last episode, Bucky finally goes meet the man and tells him the truth. He literally says, I killed your son, and that's that. We don't get to see the rest of the conversation, how either of them reacts, nothing. The scene just ends. It's awkward and lame and frankly dismissive. This doesn't even count as bare minimum time and respect a conflict like this deserves. This story is empty. But at least we now have a standard for what Brown Table considers golden. And seeing a hero trying to find love is just such a nice feeling. Creepy stock footage, ahoy! Is that from Storyblocks? Seriously, what the fuck were you trying to say with that? Just look at those soulless eyes, that locker room peepster grin. What the fuck is that face? I think it's because most of the time the hero falls in love with the obvious female lead and seeing something a lot more casual is very much appreciated, at least by me. Now if only there was any chemistry, both in terms of acting and script. Thing is, Bucky's guilt, his past that he can't escape still traps him. By the by, while we are on the topic of past regrets and loving, Am I the only one who feels like Bucky's Zero game is just sad and weird? I mean, think about it. When was the last time you think this guy got the chance to enjoy the company of the fairer sex? That was back in the 40s, wasn't it? He must have some bottled up fancy something fierce if you know what I mean. So one would think that he'd relish the mingling a bit more. I'd picture Bucky as someone with assertive charm to him. A bit more grit. Someone who sweeps a lady off their feet and then shows them tremendous, earth-shattering good time. But of course, everyone in the MCU has to act like an asexual amoeba. Other than pre-Iron Man Tony Stark, that whore dog. I'm obviously jesting, don't get your boxers in a bunch. It shows flaws in our heroes, our heroes aren't perfect, and then we meet John Walker who exhibits similar flaws. He's just a person, but now has to embody the symbol of an entire nation. Captain America is more than Iron Man, than Hulk, than friggin' Iron Patriot because he symbolized the best of what America can be since World War II. Captain America is an icon. John Walker has been built by the US government to become that icon, and to meet those expectations is pretty much impossible. Not much to comment here, other than the fact that Walker would absolutely be suitable to inherit the mantle of Captain America. Impeccable service record, countless lives saved, the camaraderie with his best mate, pristine moral compass, Walker has all the attributes the previous Cap had. Let's not forget also that there never was supposed to be another Captain America. Steve chose Sam to be a successor, but Sam ultimately takes the personal choice to decline and hand the shield to a museum dedicated to Steve and his accomplishments. That's how the legacy of the shield was supposed to end, only for a new Captain America to be brought forth despite what Sam and Steve wanted. Okay, there were some obvious contradictions in that set of sentences. 1. There was supposed to be another Captain America. The legacy of the shield was supposed to go on, as indicated by Steve gifting the shield to Sam. 2. Sam decides to go against Steve's wishes and gives the shield away. By doing so, he forfeits any right to argue from the point of what Steve would have wanted because he himself went against Steve's wishes. 3. You say that a new Captain America is chosen despite what Sam and Steve wanted. But Steve wanted there to be another Captain America. You even said so yourself. Did you not think at all what you were saying when you drew this absolutely ridiculous statement out of your worthless mouth? Just a suggestion, but redrafting is your friend. You'll pick up on obvious nonsense like this, and it saves someone like me the trouble of comping through your dumb shit. And then there's Carly. Oh boy, is there Carly. Easily the weakest link in the entire series, but that doesn't mean her story is any less poignant. Excellent. The first point we can actually agree on. Carly is garbage, and the worst part of the show. However, you just had to follow up with that but. 
a commentary on how the United States, more so the world, treats its refugees and immigrants, Carly wants to return the world to how it was before the blip, when people were helping each other during crisis. And conveniently, the story never bothers to show exactly how the world used to be. There isn't a single flashback to anything to justify Carly's point of view. They just claim everything was better back then, but it's all bullshit, and the makers of the show know it too. Otherwise, they wouldn't be so opposed to actually showing us examples of the supposed utopia Carly and her cohorts believe in. For five years, people have been welcomed into countries that have kept them out using barbed wire. Bruce. And then boom, just like that, it goes right back to the way it used to be. To them, at least Carly's doing something. What? Countries defending their borders? Oh, the horror! And this is some fantastic characterization for Sam, congratulating a terrorist. At least Carly is doing something. Like killing innocent people, conspiring with supervillains, not to mention threatening your own family at one point. You heard it here first, folks. It doesn't matter what you do, no matter what monstrous crimes you commit, as long as you are doing something. And so, the Flag Smashers want to return to a world without metaphorical flags, as in no countries, no borders, and while their intentions can definitely be sympathized with... No. Fuck you. Absolutely no. There is nothing about Carly and her ideology worthy of entertaining. She and her gang of dumbasses are utterly retarded. Selfish, self-entitled, arrogant, psychotic, worthless children. That's who they are. They have no clue about how the world actually works. They just want something for themselves, for their own ego, just because they feel like they deserve it. The show shows them, especially Carly, growing increasingly violent and radical and not in the epic way. You know, the thing that actually happens when you entertain the whims of terrorists instead of stopping them. And Zemo is out here increasing the tension of it all. He believes that Carly is a supremacist, he believes that the super soldier serum will corrupt and the Flag Smashers will place themselves above others. And he would be correct. They are placing themselves above others. They try to force their view of the world upon others using violence. And not the Twitter fake kind of violence where you feel violated because someone typed at you angrily, but the actual I killed all of these people and I will continue killing lest you comply type of violence. You know, the sand people variety. One war. One, One people. people. One war. One, One people. people. Unable to realize that that isn't assured and Steve Rogers, for example, isn't like that at all. But that's the thing, isn't it? Steve Rogers is one of a kind. Train on. What does it feel? Like it's someone else's. Just as an aside, this video has no structure. We went from talking about the sympathetic terrorists into a random quote from Endgame, and now we are jumping into something else. There's all this shit about the Flag Smashers and the Power Broker, and it's all pretty messy and it prevents the series from being the best it can be. The main villains prevent the series from being the best it can be. You know, the driving force of the plot? The narrative component we spend considerable amount of time suffering through? But the show is still among the best of the MCU. Sounds like blatant case of denial to me. But please, do go on with the apologetics. But when the series excels, it does so with so much force because it knows what it wants to say with at least one of its stories. Hold up. Exactly how many concessions are you gonna give this show? At least one of its stories? Implying that all the other storylines are executed less than ideally? This praise for the supposed best thing in the MCU is turning into an utter farce. I've asked this already, and I'll ask once again. Do you even listen to yourself when you say these things? In any case, which of the stories are you talking about? Let's hear it. Captain America the hero, Steve Rogers, is a great man with incredible ideals, willing to go against his country in order to do what's right. But Captain America is more than Steve Rogers. It's a symbol that has many different meanings to many different people. Sam, Bucky have only ever really seen Captain America as Steve. Meanwhile, people like Zemo and Isaiah see the shield and think of the problems in the world. Those stars and stripes don't mean nothing good to me. Desire to become a superhuman cannot be separated from supremacist ideals. 
anyone with that serum is inherently on that path. There is definitely room for an actual discussion on these topics. Sadly, the show isn't equipped to handle any of it. The viewpoints it offers are painfully pedestrian. At best, it's reductive, and at its absolute worst, it's blatant race baiting, pandering to the domestic terrorist groups of America. I wonder whether or not you'll ever mention the snide comments Isaiah and Sam make about white people, or the fact that the Dora Milaje are a bunch of deranged cunts acting like the world police. Supremacist ideals indeed. That's also the kind of thing Walker now has to deal with. Do you know who I am? Yes, I do, and I don't care. It's kind of brilliant how the show makes Walker very obviously not Captain America, his attitude, his behavior. I'm gonna cut you short right here, because I know exactly the bullshit argument that's coming soon after, and I wish to tackle that separately. So, about Walker's attitude and behavior, what exactly is condemnable about it? Your example is him roughhousing a criminal, a proven terrorist sympathizer. What was he supposed to do? Kiss him on the cheek and rustle his hair? As a person, Walker is a sympathetic guy. His actions throughout the show are all justified by his desire to protect the world from crazy people. Actual murderers. Not to mention that he clearly cares about his comrades, shown by his relationship to his best friend Lamar and the way he extends an olive branch to Sam and Bucky multiple times, even though they keep spitting at his presence just because he isn't there, precious Steve. Put side by side, the main characters of this show are a couple of naive, whiny little kids. Meanwhile, Walker conducts himself like an actual adult would. Now, let's hear the rest of your hilariously misguided analysis. It's kind of brilliant how the show makes Walker very obviously not Captain America, his attitude, his behavior ultimately culminating in him, someone with authoritative power, murdering someone who, while in the wrong, can't defend himself and is begging for his life. Okay, there it is, the big scene. The scene that proves how easily viewers are manipulated. As per usual, Brown Table, you ignore the actual facts of the scene, mangling and twisting all the elements to support your analysis. Let's take a look at what actually happened in the scene. The terrorist in question, Nico, was part of an ambush where the Flag Smashers tried to murder Walker. That was their stated goal. Nico himself holds Walker in place so that Carly can kill him. The plan fails only because Lemar, the absolute bro that he is, saves Walker at the last second. After that, Carly punches Lemar with her super-powered fist, slamming him against a stone pillar, snapping his neck. Lemar is dead. The Flag Smashers flee with their tails between their legs like the pathetic wastes of air that they are, and Walker gives chase. He follows Nico, who continues to fight back, throwing a piece of concrete at Walker. Now, remember, Nico is a super soldier too, so for all intents and purposes, he was trying to kill Walker here too. A few seconds later, Walker manages to catch Nico and swiftly ends him. Nico never begs for his life. He only keeps screaming, it wasn't me, which is a fucking lie in the context of the events. He was part of the assassination attempt. He knew exactly what they were doing. He is equally responsible for Lemar's death. He is a dangerous terrorist, a murderer and deserves no mercy. Also, Nico is perfectly capable of fighting back. He is a super soldier after all. There are no restraints for superpowered beings in Walker's possession. If Walker hadn't put him down, Nico would have absolutely fled and rejoined the terrorists. And as for authoritative power, as you put it, that has no bearing on the situation. Walker has no authority over Nico. He doesn't recognize him as an officer of law. He is merely an enemy to him. You yourself showed that Walker commands no authority in foreign lands. Do you know who I am? Yes, I do, and I don't care. You cannot have it both ways. Right here, right now, Walker and Nico are two men locked in mortal combat. Walker did what he did justifiably, ensuring his own survival and the survival of others in the vicinity. He killed an amoral lunatic. By any metric, he should be considered a hero. But of course, 
the show itself does its best to paint the situation in a negative light. The music is all dramatic, the death is shot from several angles, placing artificial weight upon the deed, and then there's the coup de grace. All of the missing blood from the MCU thus far is suddenly manifested upon Walker's shield. It's hilarious to think how many people Steve Rogers killed as Captain America, and not just villains, mind you, let's not forget the disaster with the giant ass airship in Winter Soldier. That shit hits the ground, a lot of people are dead. But no one ever mentions those atrocities, because there's no blood. It is painfully obvious what the showrunners are trying to convey with this scene, but the actual events on the screen simply do not line up. Audiences are ridiculously easy to manipulate, because most people don't spare even a moment to think what they are consuming. Facts? Truth. Walker did nothing wrong. Try again, Brown Table. And please stop embarrassing yourself. John Walker doesn't have what it takes to be Captain America. It should have been clear as day when this bit of dialogue popped up. You ever jump on top of a grenade? Yeah, actually I have, four times. It's a thing I do with my helmet, it's a reinforced helmet, it's a long story. So according to you, Walker isn't fit to be Captain America, because he jumped on a grenade and saved a lot of people, on four separate occasions. He saved lives, and he isn't fit to be the symbol of heroism. What the hell kind of paint have you been sniffing? That is the most insane thing you have said thus far in this video. If I were to give you the most generous best faith interpretation of what you were trying to insinuate, and I have no idea why I would want to do that at this point, I could assume that your problem is that Walker is boasting about his deeds. Yet that doesn't hold water either, because Bucky was the one who brought it up. He asked, smugly I might add, and Walker answered. I really can't fathom how defective your brain work is. By all logic, you shouldn't even be breathing at this point. And even though John Walker isn't the greatest guy, he's genuinely doing his best, which is what makes his character so compelling. Fantastic. A second point we can actually agree on. Your analysis was all bullshit, but hey, at least you got the bottom line correct. Walker is the best part of the show, hands down. Granted, that's not saying much, but still. I would have rather watched him bash that worthless sack of shit in the face for 6 hours straight, instead of this clusterfuck of a narrative that we actually got. But there's that difference between his approach to things, which is pretty much violence first, compared to Sam's approach, which is to understand the enemy and attempt to neutralize the situation without anyone getting hurt. A lot of people are already hurt and dead because of the ginger bitch. Sam is a naive dumbass for trying to reach out to her. There is nothing to understand. She is insane. And the most perfect part of this is the fact that the beetroot skank only gets worse, even threatening Sam's family directly, and even then, Sam keeps simping for the carrot cunt until the very end of the show. It is absolute insanity. It would be funny if it weren't so tragically dumb in a Darwinian sense. Sam has this caring, nurturing side to him. We see this in Captain America the Winter Soldier, when he's helping people process their PTSD, their traumas. And in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we see him trying to understand Carly's issues to better resolve the conflict. Oh wow! I never knew how to spell the word conflict until you showed it on screen. Thank you so much! You've done a great service to us all! And by the by, it's fucking insulting that Sam doesn't extend the same courtesy to Walker. He allows Carly to do whatever she wants, and refuses to take her down even though he has several golden opportunities to do so. Meanwhile, he disrespects Walker every chance he gets, basically telling him to fuck off, even right after his best friend gave his life to save him. Where's that nurturing soul of yours there, Sam? This show wears its disgusting ideology firmly on its sleeve. According to the show, we should cuddle and respect literal murderers, and actual heroes and protectors of people can go fuck themselves. Because we need to defund the police or something. It's no wonder America is burning right now, when people keep guzzling this kind of garbage and taking their morals from people like Sam and Carly. Carly in general is a fine, albeit underdeveloped character. 
She kills people, but only people that were involved with the mistreatment of other human beings. Oh, no, 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 no. You do not want to go down that slippery slope. Do not make excuses for terrorism. And the people Carly kills weren't mistreating people. That is never shown. You are talking out of your ass. And her motivations are noble, she's just going about it in the completely wrong way. There is nothing noble about Carly and her gang of Antifa light. Their only motivation is that they want stuff. Stuff that doesn't belong to them. So they murder relief workers and steal their stuff. And then hand it away all willy-nilly, believing that resources are infinite. Carly has zero grasp on politics, economics, or basic common sense. She doesn't care about human life, she only cares about serving her own ego. If she had her way, she would turn the entire world into Venezuela in a week. The Flag Smashers are working towards purely their own interest and ideology, while murdering people who don't agree. By your logic, every terrorist, every dictator, and every religious zealot has noble motivations. Learn the meaning of words before you use them. Maybe if I just put this word over here on the screen in big white letters, you'll understand its meaning better. Her journey, going from wanting to save people to eventually killing people and being okay with becoming a martyr because there will always be people who will believe in the Flag Smasher's cause, is pretty wild and pretty great. There you go again, lying about the content of the show. Carly never saves anyone, and she is okay with killing people right from the start. There is no journey, she is insane right from the beginning. The only problem with Carly is that her goals are too broad. The only problem? Man, you have some standards. The show makes it clear why she's doing what she does, but it doesn't make her endgame super clear. And without a clear endgame, the audience will always feel slightly unengaged with the conflict because they're not super sure what people are fighting for. I'm personally unengaged because the script is horrible, the characters are all whiny kids in adult bodies, and the show keeps saying that the only respectable person fighting for justice is an evil bad meanie man, even though he's the only one making the right decision at every turn. It makes for really weird scenes where Carly and the Flag Smashers just talk about their beliefs and how the world is screwing them over and how they're gonna stop it, but like, how? <laughs> Seriously, how? Indeed, how? You are willing to admit that the villains are incomprehensible, yet you are still underselling the impact they have on the structure of the whole narrative, which is devastating. Just like heroes need clear goals to be engaging, villains require this too, even more so than heroes, seeing as the heroes usually act as a direct counter to the villain's evil plans in most stories. The villain's goal can be simple, it can even be simplistic, even the trite world domination is fine enough. What matters is that it is something tangible and clearly achievable by the villains. Otherwise, there are no stakes, the narrative turns into mush, and the villains and heroes alike all look like inept morons. Thankfully, plans are set in motion by the final episode. And what exactly are those plans? By the show's end, the most mid thing about the show is the Flag Smashers. I swear I didn't edit that. That's the amount of non-sequiturs we are dealing with. Once again, you dodge mentioning the actual thing that happens on screen, because that would mean you'd have to talk about how utterly asinine the plot is. For the record, the final episode is no way better than the ones that came before when it comes to the villains and their nonsense. There's this international vote happening, and the Flag Smashers kidnap all the elected officials so that the voting will go the way they want, even though that means that the vote cannot in fact go either way, and the nations would just elect a new set of officials, so... Yup, the Flag Smashers are brain dead children all the way through. Weird reason to be thankful, but hey, I've been left utterly baffled by your mental process thus far, so it's par for the course. There's this overall tone to the show that I don't think I've felt in the MCU since maybe Winter Soldier. Before that, it'd have to be Iron Man. And I think it's because the show, along with those two movies, want to portray reality in a more serious, honest way. Sure, if you wish to cherry pick all the individual elements that could be seen as serious and honest. But to do that, you also have to leave out a lot and I do mean a lot of fantastical convenience. Serious reality is yet to be achieved in the MCU in any true capacity. 
Tony Stark? Yeah, he was an arms dealer who propagated wars. Captain America? Worked in a corrupt institution of the government, S.H.I.E.L.D., and the only way to defeat Hydra was to completely destroy S.H.I.E.L.D. for it to be rebuilt by the right people. While causing untold collateral damage and several casualties. But we don't mention those because there was never any blood or ominous camera angles. Honest and serious. And now, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Isaiah Bradley is one of the most important characters in the entire series, despite showing up in a handful of scenes. He's an important retcon and plot device for all the race baiting, most definitely. Someone who was tested on by the government to ensure the continuation of the Super Soldier Serum to create the next Steve Rogers? His story is so tragically told, I cried, man. <laughs> <laughs> His story is so tragically told, I cried. This random guy with no personality and no link to any of the established characters coming out of literally nowhere telling his obviously fake life story? This made you cry? If this actually hit you in the feels, then I can't imagine how you function in day-to-day -day life. How do you read the news without instantly curling into a fetal position sucking your thumb? Grow some fucking balls! And funny you should phrase it like that. Told, not shown, the best thing in the MCU, a visual medium, telling, not showing, fuck me. The tale itself is lazy, has several blatant plot holes in it, and I for one couldn't take it seriously for even a second. I'm not sorry for having higher standards than you. A couple of the boys get captured on a mission. Dramatic! Those are my men. My brothers, not evidence. Boss! So I bust out of the facility one night. But like, how? And I brought them boys back. Seriously, how? Isaiah has lost faith in his country and in the symbol of Captain America. Because all he sees when he sees the shield is the pain it caused him, and the lives and history that were erased for it. So he's a self-centered, bitter old man. Because if a single branch of an entire country fucks you over, that means the whole institution is rotten and has nothing to offer. Is that it? What about the millions upon millions of people who have actually lived happy and prosperous lives due to the values and laws that the Stars and Stripes represent? Isaiah's problem should be the shady men who did him wrong, not America as a whole. See what I mean when I say that every single character in this show is a whiny child? It's an important moment for Sam because it's the question of, should I be Captain America? No, he shouldn't. He already gave away the title. Sam is like a kid who is bored of a toy, puts it down, and when another kid picks it up, now he suddenly wants it. That's the story of Sam in this show. The bigger question being, should I even try to become the symbol Steve represented, a symbol that represents America's greatest values, when a part of America won't accept me as the face of that symbol? Have you ever heard of this thing called elections? There will always be people who won't be happy with the person representing them. To expect anything else is just naive. And as for Sam and his situation specifically, there is no one in the entire MCU who has ever said to him that No, I won't accept you as Captain America. The show is inventing this conflict out of thin air. They will never let a black man be Captain America. Be Captain America. Be Captain America. Yes, we can. It makes one wonder what decade this show thinks it takes place in. Forget Carly, forget Zemo, forget Sharon. Trust me, I will try my best to forget about this show. But that's gonna take plenty more brandy. One of the things the Falcon and the Winter Soldier is all about at the end of the day, like it or not, is representation. Okay, I'm gonna withhold from saying much right now. Let's hear some elaboration. But given the build-up, I'm smelling a spicy meatball coming. You know it's interesting, I'm rather young. Please. Save me from the dire corona. Oh, ye terrorists of the domestic variety. 
You know, just a few years ago, I was a dumb teen who thought that having to see yourself in superheroes was cringe. Who cares if Peter Parker doesn't look like me? Spider-Man still rules. Superman's this white dude, but who cares? It's all about the character and their relatability. And as a dumb teen, as you yourself put it, you were absolutely right. People should relate to heroes for the content of their character, not their outside appearance. That is some basic level wisdom that even little children have, whether they are able to verbalize it or not. But that worldview is in the past tense for you, now isn't it? It's all about the character and their relatability, their struggles and all that shit you hear time and time again, and then I saw Spider-Verse. And for the first time, I saw a Latino superhero on screen, a biracial Spider-Man, and the moment Miles' mom spoke Spanish and Miles spoke Spanish back, I knew that I had been wrong for years. Do I prefer Peter Parker over Miles Morales? Hell yeah! I love Peter Parker, he's the OG, he's Bay, you know? But Miles has more in common with me than Peter ever will. And that's important. And now, seeing Pedro Pascal, a Latino in The Mandalorian, seeing the Shang-Chi trailer, this Asian dude kicking ass, and Mark Grayson, another Asian character being the main hero of this animated series, Invincible, I'm just so happy that I get to see characters that reflect my roots on the big screen. And it's important for black kids to be able to see a story about a man that looks like them, deciding to become the symbol of America. Miles has more in common with you than Peter ever will, because of his race. Bravery, self-sacrifice, determination, intelligence, gallantry, love, hopefulness, trust, eagerness. None of these attributes is enough for you to relate to fictional heroes. None of these attributes alone is enough to inspire you and make you strive for these ideals. You will always be more like Miles than Peter, not because you exemplify any of the traits that make either of them a hero, but because you have the same skin color. So according to you, it doesn't matter who the heroes are as people, it matters what they are. The genetic attributes they have been born with give them extra value in your eyes. The race of characters is the key difference that makes them relatable. Furthermore, you are implying that kids cannot absorb good morals and life lessons from people who do not look like them. It's important for kids to see a story about a man who looks like them. These are your words, not mine. Why exactly is this important? What difference does it make? You never offer any justification for this, simply state it as if it were a fact. I for one would never say anything so monumentally stupid and frankly racist. Here's an example. One of my favorite movies of all time is Wally. -E. How much do you think I'm able to relate to the main character, who is a tiny robot on wheels? I can, and I do. I love the little guy, but not because of his outer shell. Last time I checked, very few of us living on this planet are robots. I relate to wall -E because his likable personality, pure desires, and overall humanity make him feel real. I'm not mincing my remarks with you, Brown Table, because laying this out is important. Your view of the world, at least when it comes to media, is morally stilted and horrifyingly misguided. You are actively promoting outside appearance as a determining factor for worthiness. That is the definition of bigotry. This is the point we are at, folks. Modern stories are so horrid that they are actively turning viewers racist. The story isn't condemning Steve Rogers, by the way. Sam idolizes Steve. It's the symbol Steve wears that certain people have issues with, and they all have legitimate reasons for hating it, seeing the symbol is false hope. I've made this point several times already. The way the show presents its political and ideological conflict turns every character into whiny children with no understanding of nuance. Sam in the end decides to wear it and give people hope again. Whatever the fuck hope means in this context, I have no idea. And to become Captain America, he has to train. And to do so, they do a montage scene. And oh my god, I've been missing montage scenes so much. Thank you. Really scraping the bottom of the barrel for the most crusty, moldy praise there is at this point. Here's something you may have missed. Previously in the show, there is a scene where Sam is getting a feel for throwing the shield, and is doing an immaculate job at it. 
Yet, later on, when this training montage hobbles onto the screen, Sam is suddenly having trouble throwing the shield. A blatant continuity error, a simple thing to fix with the tiniest bit of editing, but that's apparently too much to ask. One of the greatest things about the finale is that while cool and fight heavy, the climax is the death of a teenager. Weird sentence. According to what I was able to find, Carly is 19 in the show. That's barely a teenager. Does Carly's age even have any bearing on anything? I'd think that the more important point would be that the climax is a death of an insane murderer, but hey, labels. And Sam arguing with those in positions of power to give more power to the people, to stop treating refugees, human beings like sheep, and to give the common person, people like you and me, more of a say in political decisions. Whether you like the scene or not is up to you, but that is what the scene is trying to say. I'm once again forced to repeat myself, but since you keep bringing it up, the show has no idea what it is saying. The moral grandstanding and naive dribble that the characters spew about peace and harmony and rainbows is puke-inducingly stupid. It has nothing to offer in terms of real-world politics. And even within the show's own universe, nothing about the political debate has any meaning, because we as viewers have no grasp on the socio-economic situation of the story. The world-building is utter ass. The moment felt like the writers genuinely were half making the speech fit the scene, and half making the speech reflect what's going on in the world today. And they failed spectacularly on both accounts. It's like the Wonder Woman 1984 ending speech, but it wasn't full of platitudes this time. I dare you to play even a single line from the speech. I fucking dare you. Go on, do it! What? You won't? Oh, you sneaky little weasel! No matter, allow me! We finally have a common struggle now. The only power I have is that I believe we can do better. <laughs> You've got to do better, Senator. You've got to step up. You control the banks. Shit, you can move borders. You can knock down a forest with the email. You can feed a million people with the phone call. Look, you people have just as much power as an insane god <laughs> or a misguided teenager. <laughs> Question you have to ask yourself is, how are you going to use it? Are you serious? It's a legitimate call for those in power to do something. And it's a wake-up call for the average person to realize that their lives are being affected by these types of people in positions of power. Oh wow, you should do something. The elected people whom you elected are making decisions about your lives because you elected them to do so. Such truth bombs. Brown table. Your intellectual standards rest firmly on the table. The show is portraying a heightened reality, and I think that's what's so cool about it. Define heightened reality. What does it mean in this context? If you are trying to argue that the show is being realistic about anything, then you are hilariously wrong. And again, you can dislike how the show's messages are delivered, that's totally fine. I personally appreciate the lack of subtlety and the directness of the message. Mm-hmm, you would appreciate shit. That has become apparent. There is no merit in the alleged messages of the show. It has nothing to offer. It literally just says, do better, and gives no true path for anyone to follow. Again, the writing is kindergarten level. And I think that's what makes it more effective. It pulls no punches, and it feels like a Captain America speech to me. Your punches must be pathetically flimsy. I will say, my only problem is that Sam's like, nah, Carly isn't a terrorist, and it's like, I get what they're trying to do, they're trying to comment on how you shouldn't immediately label groups of people and just brush them off, but she kinda broke into a government building and kidnapped people and was willing to kill them, and also blew up a building injuring 11 people and killing 3? I don't know, it felt like such a weird thing to say and it would have been so easily avoided if they just made Carly not kill people. Took you long enough, but you managed to say something correct once more. Congrats, have a cookie. Just scrub all of those weasel words like kinda out of there. Carly did not kinda do anything. And you also said that her goals were noble, 
and that she was sympathetic earlier, so I have no clue what your moral ideals are anymore. But hey, maybe I'm wrong and I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm on YouTube after all. <sighs> the one time you get anywhere close to the truth, you cover your ass and refuse to stand behind your words. You are fucking pathetic. In my opinion, the series can be a little messy and the finale is a little bit sloppy, but ultimately, everything pulled together. And the emotional climaxes of everyone's arcs makes it such a great watch. Your criteria for good writing is like Carly, soulless and absurd. There were cheesy scenes that felt Raimi-esque, which made me feel excited to watch a superhero on screen again. If you didn't realize, this is what's on the thumbnail of the video. It is a masterpiece, James. Complete. Comprehensive. And yeah, I put that in for the meme. I don't really think the show is a masterpiece in every possible way. But you still believe it to be among the best of the MCU. Or did you also say that in the beginning for the meme? Fuck me. Can people try to stand behind their statements and hold some kind of principles for more than 15 minutes? I don't really think the show is a masterpiece in every possible way. Like, John Walker is now a US agent, and his journey was really weird. His redemption was way too quick in my opinion, and I feel like by the way his character was progressing, he wouldn't have saved the bus full of people. But that's just me. Indeed, it is just you. Anyone with even a sliver of intelligence would have seen from the start that Walker is a good man, and that he would do the right moral choice. Save innocent people, or chase after your sworn enemy. Walker does the correct thing, even though he struggles with his emotions. For the call of revenge is powerful. He is honestly the best part of the show, and the only story that is an actual arc. He should have continued as Captain America, and that's not just me. You hear that, Brown Table? That's called conviction. Consider it sometime. Thing is, this show is one of the few MCU productions that has truly impacted me. One that made me feel, made me think, made me cry. You truly have questionable taste. That's as nice as I can say it. I've always been critical of the MCU for robbing creators of their distinct voice, but it does seem like they're getting much better at it. WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier are the exact same Marvel sludge as the rest of them, only with ever worsening scripts. To place them anywhere above their ilk requires Olympic level mental gymnastics and an utter lack of understanding of what makes a narrative cohesive. It doesn't matter what these shows were going for, or whether or not they had a so-called vision behind them, execution is everything. If you endlessly forgive flaw after flaw and say a show is good no matter what, you forfeit the right to criticize anything, because the same apologetics can be applied to any piece of art. Please have standards. And with how Phase 4 is going and how Loki is looking, I don't know how to feel about Disney anymore. Captain America 4 has been announced, Sam Wilson is now Captain America, and that's dope. I'm excited for the future of the MCU once again, like I said with my WandaVision video. And I hope Marvel keeps going forward with this type of storytelling. Well, I'm sure your hopes will be realized. The standards of writing will keep plummeting, and stupid people like you will keep lapping Hollywood's ball sack like the pretentious sewage brains that you are. You have no principles, you do not assess stories with equal metrics, you simply like what you like, and then you try to sell your nonsensical opinions as profound and meaningful and new and daring, and you just make complete asses out of yourselves. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is a lame joke, and you are the punchline. My only hope is that no aspiring writer ever takes cues from garbage like this. I'm done with this shit. Hello, hello, hello. You are still here. Then I guess you decided to endure this journey all the way to the end with me. Thanks for that. If you enjoyed the video, do the usual. Leave a like, share it around, and subscribe for more random stuff in the near future. And in case you didn't enjoy the video for whatever reason, then I'm sure you will let me know in the comments. While you wait for my inevitable return, maybe browse through my previous catalogue of rants and critiques. Or if you are looking for something to wash away the taste of Disney from your mouth, something that's fresh, made with actual integrity and passion, and you don't mind stories in written form, then check out my original book project Destiverse. In any case, 
I've already taken a full hour of your time, so I won't keep you longer. Thanks again for hearing me out. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.